I'm Bob Darnton, the Harvard University librarian, and I'm here to introduce this panel and to give you a much more precise idea of what's going on. As you know, the DPLA is, in a way, the new kid on the block, you know, born yesterday. But in actual fact, uh, you could say that the inspiration for the DPLA, sure enough, goes back to the founding fathers, the people who are enshrined in the National Archives. Um, and I think, actually, Jefferson put it perfectly when he described what he called the action of the thinking power called an idea as a process of transmitting light. Quote, he who receives an idea from me receives instruction himself without lessening mine, as he who lights his taper candle at mine receives light without darkening me, end quote. Now, I have to admit that the devil can quote Jefferson. Uh, <laughs> and it's easy to sound high-minded about enlightenment it's also difficult to translate abstract principles into concrete reality. After all, someone had to pay for Jefferson's taper, his candle, and Jefferson himself was not great at business plans, uh, especially when it came to running Monticello. So the time has come for action, practical action, business plans included. The DPLA has now reached the stage where it needs to tap another American tradition, the can-do, no-nonsense, pioneering, and pragmatic spirit that also accompanied the founding of the Republic. America was built in large part by entrepreneurs, and enterprise was often public-spirited. I mean, think of Andrew Carnegie. He used his private wealth to build public libraries across the entire continent, opening access to knowledge for millions of Americans who had had very little contact with books. We need a Carnegie system for the 21st century, one that will make the cultural, his the cultural heritage of humanity accessible to everyone, to K through 12 schools, to students in community colleges, to startup experimenters in garages, senior citizens in retirement communities, ordinary people everywhere with a love of literature, a thirst for learning, a desire to get ahead, and curiosity about the world surrounding them. Well, we can do it. We can make it happen. In fact, it is already happening, and therefore, we would like to report on the work in progress among six groups organized by the DPLA Secretariat with the mission to tackle key issues that must be resolved if we are to get this library up and running, at least in a preliminary phase, 18 months from now. So the first report will come from Peggy Rudd, she's director and librarian of the Texas State Library and Archives Commission, and she will report on the work done and to be done in the audience and participation work stream. Peggy. Thanks, Bob. And my co-chair uh, for audience and participation is Carla Hayden at the Enid Pratt Public Library. Um, as you can see, the mission statement is still, the, our, our version of the mission statement is still a work in progress. Um, but this is what we created, and I had a very lively group of individuals, and we engaged in very rich conversation yesterday. But our vision is, our mission is, <clears throat> to create a digital public library of America that is a trusted first platform for knowledge online and is universally accessible, participatory, and compelling for all. Um, and the next slide, I think, is the members of the work group. And no, it's not. Well, anyway, okay. <laughs> yeah, we'll keep moving. Um, our top priorities, because that was the next thing that we were to really focus our attention on, is, um, and, the, and also the questions that, um, that need to be researched or need to be delved into, 
is the cultural relevance of what's in the DPLA. We want to foster social interaction, um, provide a, a, a pivot point for people's lives as they're interacting and intersecting with the DPLA, and that it be universally accessible. So, um, what is the killer app was one of the uh, questions that was asked, a service that's user focused in, uh, in, and that enables collaboration between and among users. What are the issues around privacy and openness? Those are, uh, there's dynamic tension there, um, but we certainly um, think that we've got to, to delve into that somewhat so that we pres can preserve patron privacy, something that's always been important to libraries and foster openness. Uh, and then communication with libraries. We've got to let libraries know, all the libraries out there, know what DPLA is. What, where are we now at, our, uh, at this stage? Uh, our top challenges, well, what is the DPLA? We've spent a lot of time talking about that and we will continue to do so. <clears throat> DPLA needs to be the first or second place that people visit to access information or use to enable access to information. If it goes beyond that, we feel it will be lost. Um, there's a tension between, as we talked about earlier, the traditional role of libraries and the evolving uh, new roles of libraries in the digital age. And we feel that one of our top challenges is understanding the voice of the typical user, not the person who might um, uh, enjoy a great deal of success with DPLA, but those individuals who might need to have additional support in order to benefit. Our work products, <clears throat> we want a blueprint for libraries so that libraries can understand how they can interact with uh, the Digital Public Library of America and how they can help their patrons interact. Talking points for librarians to bring back to their funders, because that's something that I think is of great uh, concern that we don't want the funding for public libraries to suffer as a result of the unintended consequence of local government officials thinking that, ah, we've got a, a national digital public library. We don't need to fund our local library any longer. Uh, defining our audiences based on the services that we want to provide because those are going to be many if you saw in beta sprints. Um, we also came up with those individuals that we think need to be added to the conversation, among them school librarians, educators, representatives from the, con con uh, from, um, the public at large, content creators, authors, and publishers. And then you can see some of the um, service priorities that we felt um, were very important for us to focus on as we begin our work on the DPLA. So, um, and as you can see, these people have been hard at work yesterday. We had a whole series of discussions. I probably should have explained that. Uh, and they are reporting on the results of these work groups. But the work groups and the work working streams have been expanding and expanding. Certainly public librarians have now become key players in defining what the Digital Public Library of America is. So the second work group dealt with content and scope. Uh, Rachel Frick, who is director of the Digital Library Federation program, will report on it. Yeah, I felt like content and scope was the pretty girl at the prom because everybody kept on saying, well, we got to know what's in content and scope before we can decide technical or the audience. But I think it's one of these things about the work streams that are working in parallel, and it's really important that we talk amongst each other as we go forward. Um, some of the things we've already talked about today really informed the conversation in content and scope, and it was the philosophies around open, interoperable, the um, idea of permanent and persistence and how it relates to trust and building trust uh, in the DPLA as a trusted resource, and um, working with people who are willing and able to contribute to the DPLA in a non-competitive and collaborative way. But it was really important not only to build collections, but to build community and that the DPLA added a unique value. So to that end, this was our mission statement. It's still in work. I mean, we were wordsmithing sometimes for just probably too much time. But to read what's already behind me, it's to facilitate the discovery and exposure of digital heritage content for permanent, open, public access for the enhancement of knowledge and community. And we hope to this end, in the next 18 months, the content and scope work stream 
Why identify and engage digital content providers and producers who are willing to participate in the DPLA content building. We want to leverage and build interest with people who we see could be brokers that are content aggregators like the Internet Archive, Hadi Trust, the IMLS DCC, and ArtStore. We also want to foster open and transparent conversations about collection development for the DPLA. So really engage the public at large in this conversation on what are valuable collections to be part of the DPLA. And we want to encourage digital content creation um, and help facilitate the discovery of more content through the digital collection. And we see uh, you know, what our top three challenges are. We're to define what we mean by content to define what we mean when we say we're including this in the DPLA, and compare our, what we were saying, our rules of engagement or what we think, and kind of uh, the ch other challenge was coordinating with the other work streams for us. So in the next couple months, I think our top priorities were to identify those content communities and their corresponding what we call community advocates or point people to help us identify the barriers for participation with DPLA what would be the incentives to participate in the DPLA, and what are the rewards for contribution to the DPLA? And to flesh out the whole idea between the, the relationships between access, persistence, and preservation. Questions? Thank you. So uh, as you can see, uh, uh, Rachel has been dealing with these questions quite a long time, and so has the Digital Library Federation program. So when I said, we're the new kid on the block. I really meant it. I mean, a lot of people have been working on these issues for a long time. So we're grateful to you for bringing that experience to it. Uh, the third group uh, dealt with the financial and business models. Uh, that work stream has a lot of work ahead of it. And many of you may be curious to know where the money is going to come. Uh, well, uh, Kevin Guthrie has some revelations there, I hope. But anyhow, he can tell us what's up. Uh, he is, as you know, president of Ithaca and has contributed enormously to this whole endeavor. So the um, revelations uh, may be too strong a word, Bob. I think uh, at this point we, we're kind of in a race where we've got a lot of interdependencies and it's ready, set, go. Uh, and we're, we're trying to pull together all the different parts. And, and some points in our conversation, we have a group of about 10, and Paul Courant is our uh, chair of our, of our uh, convening group. And our mission is pretty simple, is to explore and develop mechanisms to generate the ongoing support for the DPLA. And in thinking about that, uh, we, we felt it was really important to think about how to, to generate <laughs> recurring demand for this, uh, for this enterprise and what it, what it provides. Because if we can generate recurring demand, then we will be able to, to, to generate the recurring supply of, of funds to support it. So we, we talked about that. And a lot of what we were, we were doing in the, in the discussion was identifying the kinds of issues that we really needed to address. Uh, and where we needed to get the input in order, as, as, the, as the people thinking about the business modeling, uh, what, what was the input that we had to have in order to make certain kinds of recommendations. Uh, so the first two key areas were, were the content, uh, you know, what is going to be in the DPLA, and the second was audience. There, those are the two key questions, and, and those of you who've built uh, internet resources, web-based resources, those are, the, those are the issues you have to address. Uh, I think that the scope of, uh, of, of this enterprise is, is, is quite large, as we've talked about, and that's okay. Uh, but at some point, some choices will have to be made in terms of priori priorities. And, and when those choices are made, then it will be helpful. That, that's when the, the business uh, group uh, and the business modeling group can start to think about what, where, to, where to start on certain aspects. The secondary pieces, obviously, on the cost side, uh, the technical solutions and the governance are going to play a big role in thinking about uh, in helping to, to determine those. So we, we know that the DPLA is going to represent a diverse collection of, 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 of things that are available and also that they'll be supported by a diverse set of resources. Uh, but again, we're going to need, need priorities. Uh, another thing that we talked about a lot was the important of, uh, importance of marketing and communications and, and, uh, and advocacy. And, and by marketing, we, we don't mean just printing out some brochures. It's that full understanding of exactly what it is, the value that this is going to provide, and being able to communicate it effectively. Uh, clearly, in certain ways, uh, we're seeing the benefit of this. As a, as a, there's been great marketing in the sense of a creating awareness of this resource and the excitement around it. It's really a movement that's being built. Um, and how the question for, for us is how to institutionalize that, that movement. Um, there were some key assumptions that. 
uh, we thought uh, we, we needed to make sure we're, 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 we're rock solid before we could go forward. I think the key one uh, was just this uh, notion that access to content by the DPLA would be free at the point of use uh, by the end user. That has implications about what your options are for the way to generate funds. And so we, we sort of said in the group, if that's not the uh, assumption, tell us now. We need to know now in order to make some, some adjustments. Um, the key questions, we tried to surface some questions that we thought would be really important for this community, for the steering group, in terms of setting priorities. And we think that if you, you know, there are, these, are, these are some bold line distinctions. Will the DPA, DPLA actually hold content? Will it actually have content? I mean, it's a key question whether it's going to have it or only distribute it, if it's only going to have metadata. That's a key fork in the road, uh, we thought. Um, will the DPLA take any kind of direct responsibility for preservation? We've heard the word preservation today in a variety of ways. There is a risk that if the DPLA says it's about preservation in certain kinds of ways, that a lot of projects distributed around would rely on the DPLA without the DPLA being, being resourced to be able to take on those responsibilities. So a key question is, is what is the preservation responsibility that DPLA would be prepared to take? Um, and I think one of the things that came up again and again, we heard it a lot today, was uh, in thinking about audience and funding, if the DPLA is to be supported by municipalities, uh, governments, uh, local, and, and be a part of local public library infrastructure, uh, the, 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 the thing that we said was the big question is going to be what's in it for the kids? And we have to really think about that from a standpoint of audience I mean, and uh, content. So we, we, we brainstormed a little bit about possible models, I mean, without having these sort of things to determine them. Um, membership was one thing that we thought about a little bit, and what would motivate members, like what would motivate pu public libraries to become members, uh, not necessarily in a, in a financial way, but just in, in terms of supporting the uh, 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 enthusiastically. Obviously, government funding is a, a major uh, potential part of this. Uh, philanthropic funding, we, we, we actually didn't know about the announcements that were coming today, uh, uh, but clearly uh, institutional foundation funding and other agencies is, is going to play a role, as uh, is the opportunity, as was raised in one of the questions earlier, for individual uh, donations and, and philanthropic, philanthropic gifts. Uh, another uh, issue that came up that we thought a bit about is, is how, at this point, there's a lot of infrastructure that exists that maybe um, isn't being used as much as it was before or could be repurposed. We think of the sort of Presidio model in San Francisco where, where some infrastructure is out there that maybe could re be repurposed uh, both in terms of you know, physical infrastructure and, and uh, in-kind services that could be provided. Uh, a really key thing we talked about obviously is at the end the de devil's going to be in the details uh, and how this works, but we really need to think carefully about the distinction between capital one-time costs and the recurring costs of supporting this. Uh, and not to get completely caught up in just the capital one-time cost, but thinking about the recurring. Um, and uh, uh, finally, uh, we thought a little bit about the possible work products and things that we could do that might be helpful as we continue to think about this, some research. Um, I mentioned the notion of the existing infrastructure. Doing some research into the inventory, thinking about what is out there, where, where are there places where uh, there might be infrastructure that could be repurposed. Um, we also thought about the possibility of a paper uh, that synthesizes existing research about the ways that making information freely and widely available uh, can support economic growth. Uh, you know, the, the, the sort of thought that free content can actually generate economic value, which is a, a compelling argument for governments uh, that, that trying to synthesize the research that's already out there. And then finally, um, conducting research uh, in, in thinking about this question that keeps coming up about the role of the public library. Uh, one of the things that kind of came up as a brainstorm uh, in our group was uh, if there were a DPLA, if there was this kind of organization uh, and brand, uh, and a local uh, public library was thinking about, or a historical society or whatever it might be, was thinking about digitizing content, if it were affiliated with this larger national organization of the DPLA, would that increase the likelihood it could make the case locally that for the funding to do the digitization? We thought that actually was, uh, was you know, that could be a compelling way to try to raise funds in local uh, uh, context. And so we thought we might want to conduct some, some research into uh, the degree to which people felt in the local communities that having that kind of affiliation would help, help support it. So that was the range of things that we talked about, clearly more uh, questions and uh, inquiries than answers, but uh, starting to develop a framework for how to think about the uh, business modeling for this. Thank you, Kevin. As you see, there are a lot of questions, and you probably have a lot of questions. So we are galloping through these presentations to leave time for your questions as well. 
The next uh, presenter is Susan Hildreth, whom you've already met, director of the Institute for Museum and Library Services. Uh, she will report on the discussions of the governance work stream. Well, good afternoon, and I'm reporting on behalf of our work stream that is ably co-chaired by John Palfrey and David Ferriero. so we really don't have to worry about anything else. They will figure it all out. <laughs> But what our goal is, is to develop a system of decision making and management for DPLA. And I think what we all found uh, in our work yesterday, as, as Bob said, there are more questions than answers. But I think uh, the first thing I'd like to say in terms of governance is that, you know, I am so thrilled to see all these interested parties in this room and staying till, what is it, almost four o'clock on a Friday afternoon. So, I mean, either your planes are late or you don't have anywhere else to go, but I'm excited that you're here. <laughs> so, I don't, want, I don't want anybody to think, well, what went on? Yeah, that, what went on on Thursday? And why didn't we know about Thursday? Uh, we have a group of dedicated individuals who are trying to get this off the ground and give it some lift. But we first want everyone to know that this is a very open process. So all of our minutes, all of our activities, all of our notes are public, and if anyone has a particular interest in joining any of these work streams, I'm sure that you would be welcome to do that. So we're really just kind of self-organizing ourselves, and we would welcome your contributions or your involvement. So one of the things that we initially talked about was models for organization. And it's challenging when you don't really know what you're going to be, but we did brainstorm some models that we thought we could do further research on, think about, learn from. And again, I would ask all of you if, I don't know that anybody's worked on anything quite like this, but if you have suggested models, please share them with us. We first thought about the obviously relevant models that we're all familiar with. We talked about web organization and there are many different web, web organizations, but we were particularly interested in the IETF that uh, both Carl Malmud and Brewster Kale were involved in. This is an organization where the qualifications for membership was that you had to come to the meetings in sandals, and voting was done by the loudest hmm, hum. So it had some interesting <laughs> protocols, and I don't know that we'll mimic those, but we had a very enjoyable time hearing about the IETF. It is apparently notorious in the web world. Uh, we thought a little bit about libraries, and in our group was Maureen Sullivan, incoming president of ALA, and we suggested ALA, and she said, well, I know that's going to go off the table pretty quickly, and if there are ALA members in here, you, you may be aware of that. But it is a model that we could look at. We also thought about looking at the Europe model that I think has worked uh, quite well there, but uh, that's a number of, of states, and we're one big organization, not state countries, and we're one big country, so it's not necessarily parallel. But we also want to look at public-private partnerships, because ultimately that's what this enterprise, I think, is going to be, so we thought about PBS and B uh, BBC. We thought there might be some potentially relevant models for us to consider uh, research networks, which though many of us are familiar with in our states in terms of um, connectivity and bringing high bandwidth to all of our institutions. There could be commercial models we want to consider, uh, global compacts, scholarly organizations, and social movements. Now it's interesting that, that I really get a sense that we are in the midst of a social movement. So, out of all these different models, there may be a synthesis that we come up with that we feel is the best way to manage this um, very ambitious enterprise. Um, but I think the most important thing for all of you to know is that, one, we're thinking about it, two, we are very open to ideas from all of you. We also talked uh, about models for participation which is going to be a topic that's going to be very much aligned, I think, with the financial and business uh, work in developing DPLA. So we thought that there, there could be different models or levels for participation. And I, as we said in terms of the, the content, there is a basic assumption that there will be content available to any individual for free. And we believe that that is a hallmark, really, of this enterprise. But we also thought that there could be institutional members that would be um, really contributing materials, 
as well as making the materials available for their audience or their clients. But institutions that contribute materials, as our major research libraries, some of our major historical societies that have really special content, all of our federal partners, um, they may have a certain level of access and or benefits that institutions that may want to participate in DPLA but not necessarily contribute content, uh, there would be some differentiation there. We also, um, in, in terms of your question about will the DPLA hold content, uh, we really think that ultimately, even if we do end up holding some content, we will also be a federated system as of a number of major nodes of information around the country. And if we identified an institution as a node for DPLA, what requirements would be involved in that? What benefits would come from that? Um, so we also, um, we're really beginning to think about how institutions would participate knowing that an individual would be able to have access to materials for free. Um, that's not to say that as a collective, we, we might not feel that our collective um, energy would allow us to enter into some extended licensing agreements with various publishers. I think we all know that the publishing model, the ebook model, and access to ebooks through our public library structure um, is really a, a challenging topic and something that's really just evolving at the time. And we are not, we think that DPLA may be able to play a role in that. We certainly may, didn't make any decision in that way, but we might be able to aggregate content so that some of our institutions or municipal jurisdictions might want to um, contribute something to D DPLA to provide access, but ultimately there will be a basic level of material that will be available free for all. And we also thought we might have some special levels of, institu of institutional institutions joining us, again, federal agencies, state libraries, other special agencies that uh, may not be able to uh, participate for some reason, but we want to have that data available to us. Um, again, I'm going to reinforce that we believe that we're operating on basic pr principles of openness and con inclusion and that all are welcome. So I'm sure many of you will go home and talk to your friends and colleagues about this, and if they're interested in getting involved, that's, we welcome that. That's very exciting. Um, at least from the governance point of view, uh, and all our other work streams too, but we are committed to try to make sure we get things done. And by doing that, in order to do that, and we hope to ramp up an actual organization so that it's in place uh, within 18 months because our wonderful um, welcomeness at the Berkman Center, we know the Berkman Center launches projects and then they go off and have a life of their own. So we wanna get a life of our own going here uh, within 18 months. So we may identify small work, work streams, work, workshops may mo go on, task force. We will make the information about those openly available to you. Anyone can participate, but we will be getting things done. So as this enterprise evolves, we'll be doing what it takes to get it done, but we also will be letting everyone know about that. One of our um, big to-dos in the governance uh, work stream is developing or identifying a model or standard for open meetings. And we'd like to have a standard that we adopt as an enterprise. So if anyone uh, lives in a state where you like your uh, privacy or open meeting laws, or if anybody knows of a Cracker Jack one they wanna use, I would say we don't wanna use the city and county of San Francisco one, which can be challenging, uh, <laughs> having lived through that. But <laughs> But um, we will identify a flexible norm that we think uh, works for us and really can be a public statement about our openness. And also we will enforce norms for participation at all our group meetings. We, everyone's been very well behaved today, but we will make sure we identify a chair of a meeting, have agendas for those meetings, have open mailing lists, and also if we do have a situation where uh, someone is, um, challenging, deal with them appropriately. But in terms of having open meetings, we certainly want all our meetings to be open. That does not necessarily imply that an individual who's an observer at a meeting will have an opportunity to comment. Not that they wouldn't do that, but we will have a clear protocol for dealing with handling of all our activities. So I think our uh, the governance group, um, I think, 
really wants to move forward. We're very excited about our opportunities, and I do think that all of us here uh, in the work groups will be working together as best as we can. But we are dedicated in our governance, governance work stream to have some kind of an organization up and running in 18 months. Well, thank you, Susan. You see, uh, 18 months, that's tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and uh, this is urgent, but it's serious. It's for real. And uh, everyone is invited to participate in this. I'm sure you have lots of ideas. And your point about this is a movement is well taken. I mean, I sense it here, the energy in this room and the energy that's been expressed e yesterday as well as today, it is symptomatic of a movement that's gathering force. So please spread the word and don't hesitate to let the governance committee and the DPLA in general know your thoughts on that subject. But we have other subjects, notably the legal and policy work streams affairs. Jason Schultz, who is associate director at the Samuelson Law Technology and Public Policy Clinic at the University of California at Berkeley School of Law. We'll report on that. Jason? Great, thanks. Um, so uh, uh, Dave Hansen and I from UC Berkeley convened the legal and policy work stream on behalf of the co-chairs, Pamela Samuelson and Jim Neal from Columbia, um, and really started to talk about what role a legal work stream, a uh, legal policy work stream would play in this process, which as you can tell is sort of a parallel process. And um, those of us who've had a lot of experience working with kind of innovative experimental kind of emerging technologies and organizations have learned that uh, the lawyers probably shouldn't lead. Uh, that actually our best role that we can play is to provide support and guidance and to be listening for things that um, might need some inputs, um, but to really play a supporting and sort of strategic role uh, to make sure everything goes smoothly, but not to get in the way of everything, uh, or anything actually. And so um, kind of, as you'll see from the mission statement, we tried to sort of portray that philosophy a bit. Um, and really to sort of think about um, our role in terms of helping the DPLA balance any legal risks that are perceived, um, building a broad digital collection, enabling experiments um, and progress in access. And so those are sort of the two things we thought we'd focus on in terms of our conversations was thinking about how do you build this collection and how do you really provide uh, broad access and the kind of experiments that are gonna happen, how can we be supportive of that? Um, so in terms of that, um, the sort of three main uh, things that we decided to focus uh, on in terms of what our priorities would be would be helping to establish best practices guidelines or policy guides. Like, so if things come up and people wanna have sort of a best practice for how to deal with a particular situation, a particular set of works, how to make them available, we can provide some of that. Um, in terms of uh, investigating emerging problems, so many of you might know about orphan works, uh, works where it's hard to find a copyright owner, but you wanna make it accessible, things like that. That's a problem that has been emerging for quite a while, but is really out there. And so in terms of that, um, identifying the common policy issues, um, what the, the available solutions are, things like that. And then um, there's an option to organize some workshops, uh, I think over the next 18 months, and we'll be wanting to organize some of our own, but also partner with other work streams to identify what some of those could be. Um, so some of our thoughts were in the area of access, there's a lot of um, discussion around the best way to provide access to, uh, say, those with disabilities, especially visually impaired people, um, issues around digital lending and sort of what are sort of the best practices there. Um, in terms of acquisition, out of print books, orphan works, um, and also looking at some of the licensing options, especially Creative Commons and other open licensing options there. And then finally, um, patron privacy, which has come up a couple of times. That's also an area where uh, policies can play an important role, especially in terms of how you design your systems and what kind of architecture or code you use. And so those are some of the things that sort of came up for us. Um, but we're really looking to play a supportive role, whereas issues are arising or if there are other places we can be sort of strategically helpful, we'll, uh, we'll be there. Good, thank you. Uh, uh, Jason, you can see that everything is connected with everything else. And that's one of the difficulties of getting organized because the legal issues are connected with the content, which is connected with the governance and the finances and so on. Uh, but I think you did a heroic uh, job of sorting through some of the legal issues and we're counting on lawyerly help in the future. But meanwhile, the, the last of the technical work streams, uh, the last of the work streams was indeed technical. And Martin uh, Kalfatovitz, 
as he's the associate director of the Smithsonian Institution Libraries. And I must say in general, uh, Martin, it's great that the Smithsonian is so solidly behind the DPL eff effort. So we're, we're grateful for that. Pass the word on to your boss. But meanwhile, can you tell us what's been going on here? Uh, first, I'd like to thank the rest of the technical, technical work stream group. It was a really good group of people. I think we came together very well. Also, my co-chair of the group, which is Chris Freeland of the Missouri Botanical Garden. Um, I think it's suitable that the technical group is going last in a situation like this because really what we need to do is build on the work of everything else that's gone before us. I think if the technical group does its work well, we'll um, appear invisible to the eventual product that comes out of the, the um, DPLA. Or even better yet, it'll be, as Arthur C. Clark said, it'll be, appear as magic. So again, what we hope to do is to make become invisible and appear as magic for the rest of the DPLA. Um, some of the challenges we noted, um, the first one is we need to actually, um, to achieve that magic, is to clarify the technical deliverables of the DPLA. So what we really need to do is figure out what those key technical things are that we'll need to create within the technical environment. Um, the second is we'll want to be a collaborative development team. So in addition to all of the work that gets done directly with DPLA and that comes out of the beta sprints and the other um, products that are out there, we really need to collaborate with those to create whatever the eventual DPLA product will be. Um, the other thing is we need to be able to um, provide input to the rest of the work streams in terms of feasibility of these ideas. Um, it's very important that we have great ideas, but at the same time it's important that they be technically feasible at the same time. So those were the challenges that we felt we faced. In terms of those deliverables, um, we had um, a number of thoughts in mind. Um, the, one of the things is that we, as Susan mentioned, we really do need to have the killer app. Um, so there needs to be the killer app that appears within the DPLA environment. And one of the things we think that the killer app will be will actually be interoperability and openness. So I think that's the key thing that we need to do is have all of this data available in ways that people can build their own shiny things on top of it while at the same time building a shiny thing that we can actually deliver within our 18 month time frame. Um, the other thing is we want to have a plenty of open systems and services, APIs that enable other people to build their own localized views of this content. So again, this can push it out to local libraries, historical societies and museums around the country so that they can repurpose this content, integrate it with their own content for their own local communities. Um, one of our short-term deliverables is we do want to do a more thorough analysis of some of the beta, of all of the beta sprint competitors so that we can actually see what's actually out there, what parts are best used, and how we can integrate the, all of that work into the final products. Um, we also want this to be a very um, participatory experience as do the rest of the work streams. Um, one of the things we want to do is, again, develop the code as openly as possible and as visibly as possible. So again, the code will be openly deposited in the, some of the primary sources that you can get code at. So we're thinking the SourceForge, GitHub, Google Code, et cetera. So appropriate places where the code can be watched as it gets developed. Um, the other thing is that we want to be able to, as a deliverable, make sure that, or for public participation, make sure that we can enable the use, reuse of the metadata, the objects, and collections, and code within DPLA. So again, whatever goes into DPLA should be able to come out of DPLA and be reused in whatever systems, services, environments that are out there. The other key thing that we looked at was some of the um, related projects. Again, we don't want to reinvent the wheel, so what other projects are out there that we can use um, ideas, code, et cetera, from. So again, looking to sort of large-scale models, you have the YouTube model, you have the Flickr model in terms of public participation of creative content. Um, we have numerous really good scanning examples that come out of the Internet Archive from a number of different workflows and different participation, participating libraries in that environment. Um, there's also the um, personal library tools and citation management tools. The well, library thing was mentioned earlier today. Zotero, Omeka, um, Zo um, Mendeley are all other tools that really will sort of layer on top of this content so you can use it in different ways. Um, again, we also have lots of collections registries, institutional repositories, and museum collections. How can those projects inform the development here? Also, we don't want to ignore the commercial side of the world, and we have lots of good examples that sort of network, um, um, large-scale network development. So you have things like Amazon. How is Amazon delivering content? 
and then also the sort of systems that are done by some of the really interesting um, commercial services. So you have Hulu, Netflix, <laughs> Spotify, Overdrive, iTunes. What kinds of um, models would they give to a, a DPLA? And then of course the big indexing services and other um, digital libraries. Um, European has been mentioned a lot today. I think that's a very key model. Um, the whole wiki community, um, Wikipedia, Wikimedia, all of that. Freebase, OCLC, um, and then again, um, some of the other types of services along those lines. So we're hoping to work within the community and again, build on what we get from the rest of the work streams to do that. Um, our key first goal, I think, is actually to have a, a joint meeting with the content and legal group to see what some of those main parameters are going to be for um, the initial builds. Thank you. So we, uh, everyone has kept to the time limit heroically, and that means that we have a good 15 minutes left for discussion. I hope you're not feeling exhausted, but uh, it, I, the energy level really is very high. And now you've got at least a glimpse, a preliminary glimpse, of the kind of organization, the kinds of financing, te technological support, and so on, that will constitute uh, DPLA. So please ask questions, and I can't see too well, but if someone can put their hand well visibly up, uh, we can get things started. There's a hand in the very back. Can, maybe a, a, a <coughs> microphone is on its en route. Thank you. Uh, and if you would, please identify yourself, sir. Martin Gomez, Los Angeles sorry, Public I Library. Good to see you. Um, the question has to do with the messages in part, but also the bigger frame in my mind has to do, here we are in Washington, D.C. And I'm curious, we've got, you know, is there already some outreach or messages being floated over with some legislators here about this project and the need for some support. All of us have congressional delegates back home, and I know it may be a little bit premature, <laughs> but I can't imagine that there's not some discussion about this at some level. What, are you, what is the thinking behind uh, getting some engagement with the uh, congressional leadership about this project? A, a very good question that has been haunting a lot of people. Can anyone answer it? Well, I'm tempted, actually, to ask uh, some of the locals, such as maybe Susan. Uh, <laughs> it's not as if you are a congresswoman, but I bet you occasionally cross paths with this other race. Could you, do you what do you think the <laughs> prospects are? You know, uh, we, we spent a lot of time talking about this uh, yesterday as well, and I, I think we all really wanted to get a good assessment of how the meeting went today. Um, and then I know that the folks at the Berkman Center are going to be uh, at least developing some press releases and getting some information out. In terms of talking with our elected officials, and I also <coughs> would love if David might want to chime in here as well, um, you know, this is an absolutely wild time in D.C. And we have the super committee here in DC that's working to get the big budget deal done by the end of November. And we're all, all the, jurist, all the agencies here are working on continuing resolutions. We don't have budgets. We hear, oh, maybe that'll be done by November before the super committee. It's really kind of chaotic. It's not to say that isn't a good time. Um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know that, that they would hear much uh, with all that noise. But I do think it's something that at least at the steering commi committee level, we need to develop a plan for when we want to make all of uh, the legislators aware that this is going on. Now, there are some legislators that are interested in digital uh, information and aware that it has a big impact on their communities, and it could be we, we want to try to identify some who we know will be very uh, familiar and supportive of our general efforts, even if we're not doing any kind of a funding ask. Um, but I would, um, I would really like David to chime in and also, uh, I don't mean to call on John. John said he wasn't going to talk anymore, but maybe Bob has some ideas. But David, do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, if there's a phone. Um, Microphone for David. There he goes.
is a lot of interest on the Hill and in the White House on this. So th those of you who have not read the President's, um, the report that went to the President at the end of December, Designing a Digital Future, a $3 billion initiative, there are places for us in that initiative. The Hill is very interested in anything at all related to K through 12. So when I have been talking about this with my contacts on the Hill, I have been pitching it in terms of its value to the K through 12 community. I was invited to Hartford not, um, th within the last three weeks by Congressman John Larson, who was a former history teacher, to talk about our product, Docs Teach, um, to a group of superintendents and teachers from the Hartford, Connecticut area, and talked about um, the Digital Public Library of America to keep their eyes on that as another source of content. So. I, in, my, in my own contacts, I have been uh, kind of planting seeds that this is something to um, pay attention to. We have um, the very first ever um, House Caucus on the National Archives has just been formed. Uh, we're having our first meeting um, up on the Hill sometime towards the end of November. It's something that I'm going to be talking about with members of the, the House Caucus. So there are, there are lots of opportunities. So th thank you, uh, David. You put in a good <laughs> word for the DPLA. W among the lawyers and people interested in the law, there has been a lot of discussion about possibly an attempt to pass uh, orphan book legislation. <laughs> and I, if, before the next question comes, I'd like to ask Jason, what, what do you think of this? I mean, should, be <laughs> should we be writing to our congressmen saying, uh, never mind about the budget crisis. Orphan <laughs> books really count. Somehow I feel as if um, <coughs> the answer has been laid out before me, uh, like any good professor. Um, no, so uh, I think that the dealing with what are called orphan works, which are defined in many different ways. Some people will think of them as works that are just not commercially viable, like out of print. Some people think of them as it's hard to find the copyright owners. There are lots of different sort of ways to sort of look at that issue, and. The thing is, is like, there is this desire sometimes to have like a one-stop shop solution and let's just put it in front of Congress. But actually, I think there are solutions already happening. People are dealing with these different sets of works and collections in ways which they're able to move forward that the law allows them to um, under various doctrines, including things like fair use. And so I actually think that um, we want to explore all the strategies. Um, if it gets to the point where it makes sense to think about trying to push on a change in law, I think then obviously that's something that has to be considered. But I, I think given some of the uh, comments already made, right, I mean, I think you don't want to necessarily get there uh, until you have to. And I th actually think there are a lot of places to go first before you even have to consider that. So it's mm -hmm. not that it's off the table, but yeah, I think like many of these things, I think we have a lot of innovative, creative places to go. Um, and I think the law supports that. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions, I'm sure you have Plenty. Uh, I see a hand over there, and then another. Glenn Hoffman. I, I hesitate to speak again on communications since the last conversation, but uh, my sense is that the conversation on communications is top down. It's policy down. It's um, the higher end use issues um, in terms of communication to the people who are involved in decision making and or policy of one form or another. I think that there's still a need for us to look at, um, if you will, the Reader's Digest and Parade Magazine reader uh, and bringing the notion of what uh, DPLA is and what it me could mean to those people who are not thinking on the level of planning a, a, a K-12 course or planning uh, an academic mm -hmm. exercise or doing uh, research of one form or another, but would look to uh, what a DPLA could provide in terms of embedded learning environments and uh, on, the, on the fly learning, on demand learning, uh, or just in general entertainment uh, of one form or another. Uh, reading still can be entertaining, I think. Uh, that said, I think you know, we're, we have to look at the bottom of, uh, and that's a very horrible phrase to use, we have to look at multiple facets, let me phrase it that way, as opposed to, um, well, you can't avoid it, but you know, top and bottom, we have to go the whole, the whole gamut. 
So uh, one consideration is to work this communication set of problems into the actual discussion that will be going on through the various work streams. And I think we have to find a way to do that. Uh, certainly with uh, the kind of user in mind that you developed, that you mentioned, you know, the ordinary reader, certainly not the college professor, but uh, the kind of person who's curious uh, about the world surrounding him or her, and then people who want to have fun. I mean, I would actually go beyond entertainment. I think books and reading and looking at items are also fun. So we want to build that in, in at least in my opinion. And we will take that very seriously as we go through the next streams of work streams. So thank you. I saw a hand over here and then maybe someone on this side of the room. Hi. Um, my name is Tali. I'm a student at um, Simmons College. Um, my issue is one of um, ideology rather than logistics. And I know that you're mainly dealing with logistics. So. Um, we're talking about openness, we're talking about access, we're talking about social movements, and as a, I'm, I'm getting my library science degree, but I'm also getting my public history degree, and I'm a little bit um, dismayed that um, DPLA is um, choosing to invoke the name of Andrew Carnegie as um, an ideological foundation, um, because while some may know him as a benefactor of libraries, um, Actually, the, the reason that he um, funded the, the Homestead Library was because of the public um, um, uproar in his direct involvement of the murder of workers in his own mill. And this might seem nitpicky. <laughs> I know this might seem nitpicky. But as the DPLA continues, and I know you'll be working with public historians and institutions, um, cultural heritage institutions, I don't think that um, this will be the first time that this is brought up because um, coming from the public history side, Andrew Carnegie is definitely a hot topic and people love to talk about him and, and pick him apart. And um, so I just sort of wanted to put that out there. And right. But our, yeah. I think that is really important, but, but um, I will say that whenever I talk about Carnegie and his role in libraries, I always focus on, uh, not on him as a person or what his motivation was, um, because I, I think that there, there are some really problematic areas when you look at the fullness of his uh, motivation. But to think about his role in partnering with local communities because what he did was he built the libraries, but only on the condition that that community would continue to support that library. So sustainability. So when I talk about Carnegie and public libraries, that's really what I focus on. And I don't think anybody here would want to focus on any other aspect of, of Carnegie. I think what Bob was really referring to is we need someone else who is going to have that same <coughs> vision of partnership. If, you're, if, if they can help us build it, then those of us in this room are going to have to help all of our respective groups and institutions and individuals that we represent use that resource to the fullest. So I don't know if that helps any, I but. I just want to add that um, I was aware of that the fact and the questions about his motivation. But um, in, the, in the last conversation about a public message, um, not that we necessarily want to overstate that, but when you think about libraries, when you think about knowledge in this country, the name Carnegie, whatever the backstory might be, is emblematic of that. Um, and as Peggy said, we know that he did a lot in communities to ensure that those communities would have sustainable facilities. But um, like it or not, it's somewhat iconic. And when you talk about libraries with the general public, the, the Carnegie, you know, raises this, not this, well, it's really recollection of their wonderful building, their dusty old building when they went when they were kids, which we want to get away from. 
And uh, I notice, I think, that the Gates folks have <coughs> left the audience, which I don't know if that's good or bad, but I personally talk about Bill Gates as a 21st century Andrew Carnegie, which I think he has done. And I, would, I, I shouldn't say that in front of, front of Doran Weber and the Sloan, who's done so much for this effort. But I do think we, uh, I, I think when we think about messaging, um, we want to be careful with that, but we also need to uh, be aware of some of these iconic images that really can have an impact with um, our generic user that we're talking about, our reader di Reader's Digest person, who I frankly think is going to be excited by DPLA because of their easy access to amazing information, and a lot of it could really be local. I'm really excited um, to hope that we can provide a platform where some of our local information that is so exciting to uh, folks all around the country and is probably never going to be mounted anywhere, but is so unique and so important uh, and could rally a community for their pride and their interest in what is unique and, and sharing that with the rest of the world and seeing that. Uh, I think that's, that's a great step forward. But um, I think the messaging, messaging is critical and we do, I do appreciate your, your sensitivity on that. Well, I'm glad you raised the point, and I actually did hesitate before invoking the name of Carnegie, as well as Jefferson, who's, you know, there were parts of Jefferson's past. <laughs> uh, but one, in my view, one of the things that makes this country distinctive is private foundations who work for the public good. The DPLA is going to depend at least for its launch, for really getting started on private foundations. And they are founded by the Rockefellers, the Carnegies, and so on and so on. So I feel that we're different from Europeans in that respect. The Europeans depend on the state. They don't have a philanthropic tradition that is in any way comparable to what is done here. So we might as well be open about it. Maybe we shouldn't run the Carnegie flag up the, f <laughs> up the flagpole too high. But the Carnegie Foundation is one foundation that I hope will support the DPLA. But we need this kind of a debate. So thank you for making the point. And I think there's a question on this side of the room. Hi, my name is Jen Wright. I'm from the Free Library of Philadelphia. And I have more of a logistical question. Do you see, and th I think this covers almost all of your groups, do you see any conflict with institutions, especially public libraries, continuing to use their digitally created items and images for uh, ge revenue generating services for the libraries? Mm -hmm. Or would you expect everything to be put out there with a complete open license? Well, I just keep speaking for Texas. Uh, we have um, uh, rules regarding what public libraries in the state, if they want to be accredited, what they can uh, charge for. And so we expect them to make everything that's available in their library, whether it's digital or it's for loan in a physical format, available for free. Uh, now, not every state will have a different, um, a different law or regulation, um, but, uh, but in our state, that's the way we handle it. Maybe Kevin Guthrie has some thoughts uh, on that. I just make one comment, uh, just real quick. I think that's a very good point that um, this young lady made. Um, and I think it bears further dis uh, research and discussion. Because even as we were sitting here discussing all these topics, I know that in, uh, for instance, I've worked at the San Francisco Public Library, the Seattle Public Library, and many cases there, particularly if photographs are being made available for commercial purposes, either the library or the friends or foundation get some kind of a fee for that. Um, so I, those are the kinds of, you know, the details uh, um, that we're going to have to work out. So I think that is uh, an important question uh, that we're going to have to deal with. Well, just to speak on that, there's been a lot of research done about this, about sharing data and sharing images, and it's definitely when we are talking about content and scope. What does it mean when we're including, or what does it mean when you contribute? Are you contributing metadata? Are you contributing objects? But um, 
there is a lot of information about this. And I think the one thing about DPLA that for me makes it very exciting is that what you deposit or bring to the DPLA should be open for reuse for anybody, whether that's commercial or non-commercial. And so if the home library still wants to commercialize their images and give them to the DPLA, I think having the freedom to do that and the space to do that is a great thing to consider in building the DPLA. I have to look at my watch. I know there probably are many more discussions, but David Ferriero has some things to say. <laughs> we have some things to say about David, <laughs> which are mainly thank you. We really appreciate it. <laughs> the floor is yours, David, and there may be some other questions as well at this point. Um, I think we have come to the moment of gleeful rendezvous. <laughs> <laughs> Next time we should have wine with this wrap up. Um, you have all now um, become official DPLA groupies by your attendance here. You're part of a new social movement. It's been an honor to have you uh, occupying my house today. Um, a couple of of high points for me today were the announcements from Europeana uh, about the uh, collaboration with us already. We're not even we're not even up, but we have a collaboration already. And I'm especially interested in the migration exhibit that's coming, um, just because of my own history and what I've discovered since I've been here about how my grandparents got into the country. The wonderful gifts from Sloan and Arcadia, thank you very much for your support. Um, David Weinberger's comment about having uh, his head and heart um, exploding um, in uh, inter exploding to interoperate. I think that's a wonderful, wonderful um, takeaway for today. David, are you still here? Yes. <laughs> Where? There. There David has a new book coming out. <laughs> <laughs> when is it coming out? Uh, it's middle of December. Middle of December. It's a book. If those of you who are worried about information overload, forget it. David has, is, um, is going to share some insights with you. Um, you've heard multiple visions of DPLA, which, which is what's so exciting about today, is that this is very much a work in progress and this is an invitation for you, you to contribute. One of the nicest things I heard today was the use of DPLA as a verb. You can DPLA it. Um, I mean, that's, uh, that's major, major, major. The beta sprints and the lightning round were exciting glimpses of what could be um, quickly, quickly um, uh, created, which is an indication of, I think, our uh, ability to move quickly on, on this. As Bob said, 18 months is not very far away. And I loved um, um, Carl's metaphors of reservoirs and bridges, uh, very much um, what we're about here. And Bob said, and I will close with, we can do it. So let's do it. Thank you all for being here today.